Well, today I would like to share with you about our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, and I could talk hours about them uh, and about our unity history, and you will hear hours about them and our unity history because Reverend Temple and I are going to be doing a new members class in the fall, so if you want to know more about who we are, that is the class to attend. Uh, so today, I am giving you just a glimpse about these two people. I'd like to start with a passage from John 1837. This passage, I'm sure many of you have had this experience where different passages from the Bible mean something to you at different times of your life. This one means something to me at this time in my life. And I want to start with this, John 1837. To this end, I was born. And for this cause, I came to the world that I shall bear witness unto the truth. My friends, when there is a dream, something that is for you to do, no, whether you know about it or not, the dream is always much bigger than what you think. And many times you have no idea where it is going or where it is going to take you. Our job in fulfilling our dreams is to show up, take one step in front of the other, and just continue to follow guidance. And so this dream that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore had expanded and grew, and this is how Unity got started. And it went far beyond their personal concept. This is what happens to us. It goes far beyond our personal concept of what we think it should look like. Now, just as a side note here, this is important. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, they were repulsed by religion. Myrtle was brought up as a very strict Methodist and uh, adhering to the strict moral codes and the, uh, there was a belief that God was a punishing God. And Charles was brought up by two parents that didn't want anything to do with religion whatsoever. And so this was his belief as well. He once said, I did not believe in Jesus Christ and I did not want anything to do with religion, period, exclamation point. But as we know, that changed after time. By the way, this is another side note, Unity was never intended to be a church. It was intended to be a way of thinking, a practice, in addition to your own religion, whatever that was. So in the beginning, their services were held late on Sunday afternoons. So you could go to your own religion, have a little lunch, then go hear about the Unity principles. Yeah. So then the state of Missouri said, if you're going to be a nonprofit, you must declare yourself as a church. And that's how and why we have unity churches all over the world. So now I want to tell you a story about a moment in time that this dream of unity was awakened. Now many of you know this story, but let me give you a different perspective, if you will. And for those of you that may not know who, what our story is about, Unity began because Myrtle Fillmore had tuberculosis. And in those days, there was no cure for tuberculosis. And because she was a mom of three little children and she didn't want to die, she didn't want to leave children and her husband behind, she was searching and she was told about a great metaphysician that uh, from the Christian science way of thinking, and this man's name was E.B. Weeks. And serendipitously, he was going to be giving a lecture in town, so she went to go hear him. And it was there that she heard him say the words that changed her life forever. The words, you are a child of God, and you do not inherit illness. And it was that one 
sentence that awakened her. How many of you have ever heard a statement that changed your life forever? Anyone in here? Yes. I know I have many times, or maybe I've read something that's just changed the way, the direction in which I go in my life. So now, here she's faced with a fork in the road. How many of us have faced a parallel reality of, if I go down this road, I'll be getting more of the same. But if I go down this road, I'll be taking a risk, but there'll be a different outcome. Now, here is where I want you to listen very carefully. When you come to this fork in the road, you are joining one of two groups of people. The first group is defined by their circumstances. That's one path. The second group defines their circumstances. That's the second path. So Myrtle was at this pivotal moment. Was she going to choose the road of continuing to have tuberculosis of describing who she was, defining who she was, or was she going to define her circumstance? At that pivotal moment, she chose to define her circumstance, and she began to study. She began to work with the idea of mind healing. She took the affirmation, I am a child of God, and I do not inherit illness. She says, I did most of the healing myself because I wanted to understand this process for future use. Little did she know, the dream of what she came to planet Earth to do was asking her to document her journey. And this is what she did. She spent day after day affirming for her body, affirming life and health. Now, I want to share with you specifically what she said. She said, it flashed upon me that I might talk to the life in every part of my body and have it just what I wanted. I began to teach my body and I got marvelous results. I told the life of my liver that it was not torpid or in inert, but that it was full of vigor and energy. I told the life in my stomach that it was not weak or inefficient, but it was energetic and strong and intelligent. I went to all the life centers in my body. I spoke words of truth to them, words of strength and power. I asked for forgiveness for the foolish, ignorant course that I had pursued in the past when I condemned them and I called them weak, inefficient, and diseased. I did not become discouraged after their being slow to wake up to keep right on but silently and aloud declaring the words of truth until the organs responded. She did this day after day and apparently month after month. And she talked to the divine intelligence that is, that's, that's active in all of our bodies that knows how to heal itself. So rather than saying, I have a weak body and being the victim to her circumstance, she declared her health and wholeness. The God in me is healthy, whole, and well. And she healed herself of tuberculosis she lived until she was 86 years old with, and being healthy, whole, and well. Throughout the years, she was called the mother of unity because she was the one that really brought birth to this dream, brought fruition to this dream. It was that pivotal moment where she could have chosen a different reality of being defined by her circumstance. My friends, this is why we say that these teachings, these unity teachings offer you freedom. Because our teachings say, you can define your experience. You have the power to co-create with spirit. And in today's 
day and age where this world kind of looks like an insane asylum, even though, you know, there's chaos around, even though there's politics that seem very intense, even though the last two and a half years or so, we have gone through this huge paradigm shift. What is really important for all of us here to remember and to understand is that we still at no point as good unity students ever see ourselves as victims. It's not what we teach. It's not what we are about. We're not about victimhood. And as Charles Fillmore once said, society teaches us to be victims. And he's right. You look out into the world, victims are, are just simply reacting to what is going on. And if you let yourself, there's plenty to react to. Would you not agree? Yeah. So when people come into these unity teachings, we are simply asking, are you willing to take personal responsibility? Are you willing to rise to another level of consciousness? And so as Charles Fillmore said, this, I love this, this is what Jesus has in mind when he says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he goes on to say, this doesn't mean to hide your head in the sand, not to face it, nor does it mean to blow up or try to forcibly change it. It means to rise above to rise to another level of consciousness. Don't think about the problem, he says. Think about God. The moment you choose out of victimhood, the moment you choose a higher way of looking at things, the moment you choose to define your circumstance instead of the circumstance defining you, your life begins to change for the better. And you have a bigger impact on all those in whom you come in contact. And that is what Myrtle Fillmore, the mother of unity, brought us at that moment when she heard those words, I am a child of God and I do not inherit sickness. She could have stayed the same, but she chose out of victimhood. And, it wasn't, and if it wasn't for her taking that path, Unity would not exist. Now, once she got into this way of being, she said she just couldn't leave her neighbors alone. <laughs> as, she, as soon as she found out that maybe someone in the, in the nearby neighborhood or even beyond, as soon as she found out that they were going through a health challenge or a financial challenge, she would go over there and do some kind of healing for them. She would pray over them. My favorite story is that one day there was a salesman that came to their house and, she, and he was uh, selling picture frames and he had this whole suitcase just full of picture frames and Myrtle was the kind of person who would just let anyone in. So she began to converse, and, uh, or they began to converse, and Myrtle and, and Charles's son, Lowell, who was just a toddler at the time, was peering in the suitcase, looking at what was in there, all these picture frames, and Myrtle said, oh, this is, this is my little boy. And the salesman said, uh, I have a little boy about that age, too, and he, he will probably never see again. He has advanced cataracts in both eyes. And she told him of her own experience with prayer, that she was healed by prayer, and, and asked if, if she could see the boy. So she went over to his home. She worked with the little boy, helping him to realize that he was a beloved child of God and that God truly loved him and that it was God's will for him to have perfect eyesight. She went back a couple of other times, and by the third time, he was completely healed. Well, word spread around, right, of all these healings that were going on. She began to offer her services for prayer, had groups of prayer, like we're doing here. We have mastermind groups now. We have prayer groups. So she began these prayer groups and soon developed a, a big following of people. And this is how silent unity was born. 
It was the first 24-hour prayer ministry that still exists today. Now, to tell you a little bit about her demeanor, in the book, The Story of Unity, Sherry, do we have that in the bookstore? I so. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's on its way, if not. So it is worth getting. So in the, in, the, um, in, this, in the book, The Story of Unity by James Dillett Freeman, he talks about her demeanor, and it says, about Myrtle Fillmore, there was always an unworldly quality that once made her husband say of her, Myrtle belongs on another planet. <laughs> she was not much concerned with worldliness. Her, her speaking was more likely to consist of the inspiration that came to her at the moment and when she spoke, though moved through her, as the, the, when she spoke, thought moved through her as a butterfly that moves through a field of summer flowers, lighting on one idea, hovering over another, tasting its sweetness, then moving on to another. I love that. Just a beautiful way to describe how she was. Myrtle was not much for chatter. She felt like chit-chat was an, a waste of energy. She was very, very in tune with her higher self. And she was very intuitive. In fact, she knew the day that she was to die. She went around Unity Village to all her, her friends, her family, the co-workers, and she said goodbye, gave thanks to them, went home that day, and died. Now, Charles Fillmore... He was born in 1854. Myrtle was 10 years older than him. She was a cougar, that one. <laughs> <laughs> he was born on an Indian reservation just outside the little town of St. Cloud, Minnesota. And his father was a trader with the Chippewa Indians. As Charles later wrote, he said as his childhood was romantic but crude and unprofitable, it was the kind of Huckleberry Finn existence. Hunters and trappers came and went, roving bands of Chippewa and Sioux Indians passed by the cabin daily. So as a kid, Charles Fillmore had a he he spent most of his time playing with the the Chippewa Indian uh, children of that of that tribe and uh, in this way he and his mother learned learned the Chippewa language as well as their culture and their different uh, ceremonies. When Charles was less than two years of age, he and his mother were alone in the cabin when a band of uh, Sioux Indians rushed up, and the leader was this uh, towering medicine man, decked in, in full ceremonial dress. He came in, took little Charles from his mother's arms, and rode off away, uh, rode off with him. And it was evening before they brought him back to his most worried mother at the time. And so they had take where where they had taken the, him or what they had done with him charles couldn't remember but he always had this feeling that they had used him for some kind of mystical ceremony the shaman ways which is beautiful that we have a shaman a resident shaman in reverend temple the shaman ways always intrigued him he was an avid reader he loved science so even though Charles was a little slower getting into and getting on board with uh, what Myrtle was doing, he's, it wasn't until he saw what was going on that he sees these miracles through prayer. He saw that there was a bigger dream that was beginning to push and uh, guide them into something bigger. When he finally joined her in these teachings, he really became the voice of unity. He took these teachings and soared, and because of his great passion, he was a fantastic teacher for these unity principles. If 
Myrtle supplied the original impetus. It was her husband, really, that supplied the greater part of the energy that carried unity forward. In the book, which will either is either in our bookstore today or next week, we have, we have them on order, the story of unity. Jane, James Dillip Freeman writes about Charles Fillmore. He was something of a prophet. He lived simply, and he lived very close to God and felt very strongly that God was speaking to him, using to convey his divine ideas. Like Joseph and Daniel, he felt that God came to him in his dreams and visions of the night and revealed to him much of the truth about which he spoke and wrote about. He was always looking forward he foresaw radio before radio was invented. He talked about it in sermons and articles. He saw the atom that it would be split and become a source of power before it even happened. His mind was always raging far ahead most persons. Now, just as a, as a personal note here, in 1982, when I was in ministerial school, there was this little room that not many people knew about. And it, it was where they had all of the Fillmore's personal belongings. And I loved going in there and snooping around. It's no longer there probably because of people like me. But <laughs> one day I came across this filing cabinet. It was over in the corner. And in the bottom drawer, there were items that Charles Fillmore had with him always. He always carried little tiny notebooks that he kept in his pocket. So whenever he had a divine idea, he would write it down. There were so many of these notebooks in that drawer. And I remember, I loved looking through them. And I remember there was this one where he wrote, there are 10 powers of man. And he listed the 10. Some pages later, he wrote, no, there's 12 powers of man, exclamation point. And then he listed all the 12. And I felt like I had just tuned into his eureka moment. It was that pivotal moment, right? And it was exciting. But you could read these notebooks of how he listened to spirit and wrote down his revelations. You could see how very connected he was. To Charles Fillmore, God was his personal friend. He spent many hours every day in simple conversation with God. He loved God so very much. And this is what Charles said about God. He said, never be formal with God. He cares no more for forms and ceremonies than do the principles of mathematics for fine figures or elaborate blackboards. You cannot use God too often. He loves to be used. And the more you use him, the more easily you use him, the more pleasant his help becomes. I love that. Charles and Myrtle were very humble. They really had a dislike for labels. Even though they were ordained ministers, they insisted on not using reverend before their name. They wanted to be called by their name, their first names only. They never wanted preferential treatment. Charles and, and for, I always call her Fertile Millmore. <laughs> Charles and Myrtle Fillmore had a simplicity about them that endeared them to all who knew them. Their faith was all that mattered to them, and they held true to their teachings. One time during the Great Depression, unity was in serious uh, financial straits. Bills needed to be, that needed to be paid were piling up, and they did not seem to have the money enough to pay, play, pay for payroll. And so the Fillmores called the staff together. Let's pray about this. And one of the staff said, let us pray that the money holds out. And, and Myrtle whispered, no, let us pray that our faith holds out. The kind of faith where in higher mind, all things are possible. And of course, the finances came through. 
So here's how Charles and Myrtle worked together to build unity. They were a fantastic team. It was Myrtle who first accepted the idea of divine healing. It was Charles who gave our teachings a voice. It was Myrtle who first led a silent unity, and it was Charles who named the work Unity and developed it into a worldwide organization that you see today. It was Myrtle who led the people in meditation and prayer, and it was Charles who made speeches and wrote books. They worked together beautifully, and from their united efforts grew the great movement that is unity. It was the dream that is birthed that you see here today. So I would like to conclude with Myrtle Fillmore saying the prayer of faith. It's, uh, it's a prayer that I grew up with. I know some of you grew up with this prayer as well. If you know it, join along. God is my help in every need. God does my every hunger feed. God walks beside me, guides my way through every moment of the day. I now am wise, I now am true, patient, kind and loving too. All things I am, can do and be, through Christ the truth that is in me. God is my help, I can't be sick. God is my strength on sailing quick. God is my all, I know no fear. Since God and love and truth are here, Amen. And to that, let us say, Amen.